I think for every athlete, you know, the biggest dream is not only going to the world championships or to the European championship. The biggest dream is to go to the Olympics. Why? Because everybody wants to be part of this festival of brotherhood and peace and love and, you know, with the expectation that you can change the world and meet people that otherwise you wouldn't be able to meet. It was a very simple reason why I came to Israel. And it's almost 50 years ago that I did so. Um, I'm from Holland, and was living in Holland. And then I decided to take up fencing. And the first um, club was the Abrahams Club, you know, alphabetic order. So I, I phoned and I went there. And I had a, a coach there who spoke Dutch, but he had a slight accent. So I thought he came from... East Europe or something, I had no idea. And then at one point I found out that he was from Israel. And the rest is history because I just followed him to Israel because he was in Holland for two years to become a better national trainer. And he was supposed to go back and I went back to him, uh, with him and we were living on the Lebanese border. And I come from, uh, from The Hague, you know, with the concert halls and with ballet and and whatever you want. And I was suddenly found myself on the Lebanese border in this small settlement. But I, that was the most beautiful year in my life. And I've never ever regretted that I made that step. And I'm still here. Andre and I were in the Olympic Village together in Munich. And at one point he saw the Lebanese team and the defensing team. And he said, Anki, I'm going to speak to them. I said, are you crazy? You know, they are our enemies, you know, we have, a war with uh, Lebanon. And he said, well, that's exactly why I'm here for. Here there are no borders. And I stayed a little bit behind. And, and he went there and, he, and I saw that he spoke to the people and they shook hands. And I will never forget when he turned around and he came back to me with a huge smile on his face. And he said, you see, Anki, that's why I came here for. And I will never forget that. So I still believe in the Olympic ideas. And athletes like Beatty and Ori and the other Olympic candidates, you know, they are for me the hope that someday it will be like Ori just said, like he wanted to be. So for us, it's extremely important to be there with them because they opened the, the, the way for us to see the future and have hope that the Olympic idea is still alive. I still, I, personally, I still believe in the Olympic idea, even after all that happens, because I believe that people can get together by meeting each other, by not uh, taking care of borders or race or gender or whatever. I think that, you know, our fight to have a minute of silence at the opening ceremony at the Olympics is not only because I want everybody to know who was Andre Spitzer. I know who he was and that's, and that's more than enough. And my daughter, who was only a little baby of two months old when her father was killed, uh, she knows who he is because of my, my, my uh, stories that I tell her. But I want the world to stand still for a moment. And I want the International Olympic Committee at the opening ceremony of the Olympics, when there are millions of people watching and when you know, 10,000 athletes are standing out in the field when they open the games, when they march in and everything. So then I want them to say, let us not forget what happened in Munich so that it will never happen again. That is the message. Everybody should take a vow when they're standing there and say, I am going to do it differently. I am here with athletes from all over the world and we will have to communicate. And everything that happened in Munich, that should never happen again. You know, they were part of the Olympic family and they were killed inside the Olympic Games. So the least you can do is stand up and give them a minute of silence for positive uh, reasons. And that's what we are fighting. We haven't gotten it yet. We have made a little bit of progress in Rio. They had a, um, a meeting in the, inside the Olympic Village with a minute of silence. And I said to the president of the Olympic Committee, I said, you made a historic step because we have been waiting for this for such a long time, yes. but it is not enough. 
I'm still waiting in Tokyo that you're going to open the games and say something about it. And I said, and you will not get rid of me. I'm already old, but if I cannot do it anymore, my children and the children of my children, they will come after you until you do the right thing. Because the world should remember. Because who, ne who doesn't remember history, he doesn't have a future. What happened in Munich 48 years ago, you know, it's still res resounding today, but we have to look forward. And we have to, you know, I, when I came back from Munich after the massacre, I was filled with anger. I was so angry. How could they do this to a 27 year old man who was only a good person? He didn't do anything to anyone. And I was in the room right after, a few hours after the massacre. And I looked around and I saw the blood coming down the stairs and I saw the, the, the bullet holes in the, in the walls. And I, I saw that they, the chaos in that room where they were kept hostage was enormous with all the blood all over the place. And they brought them food, but nobody wanted to eat, of course. And they didn't let them go to the bath. It, it was a, a, a terrible disaster. And I was standing there and I said, is this the place where my peace-loving young husband, who just had a baby daughter, you know, if that's what he spent his last hours of his life, I cannot stop talking about it. I have to tell about it so that it will not happen again. And, you know, but I came home and I was very, very angry uh, the first couple of months. And then at one point I, I took uh, a hold of myself and I said, how can I raise my baby daughter with hate in my heart, I cannot do that. I have to make a switch, I must make a switch because you cannot raise children with hate in your heart. We went in Atlanta in 1996, there were Olympic games and we decided to bring all the orphans. There were 14 children left after, after the athletes were murdered. Four of them were not married, but there were 14 kids. They, in the meanwhile, they were teenagers and I decided to take them to the Olympic Games in Munich because they lived their whole life in the shadow of the Olympics. And I wanted to show them the glory of oh, how the, yes. the teams come in. And then I heard that the Palestinian team for the first time was walking also inside the stadium. So I gathered the kids and I said, look, there is a Palestinian team uh, coming in. What a delegation also, together with all the other delegations. What are you going to do? And they looked at me, all of these kids, and they said, well, we are going to do the same thing as we do to the other delegations. We are going to stand up and applaud them because they have nothing to do with what happened to our fathers. That was many years ago and these are also athletes. And I looked at them and I thought to myself, well, that's victory. This is what I wanted, not to raise these kids with hate in their heart because they didn't have hate in their heart. And then in the aftermath of the opening ceremony, I tried to find the, the delegation leader and I found him, the Palestinian guy, and I said, look, tomorrow we have a big uh, memorial service in Atlanta uh, we would, and all the kids are here. Would you please come if you are more than invited to, to meet them? And he came with his delegation. There were four or five people and they came and they met the, the kids and they embraced each other and they were together with us at the uh, memorial service. And I think that was, for me, my personal biggest victory, that there was no hate.